Uh, our speaker this morning is Scott Zona, uh, one of our Piedmont chapter members who lives in Hillsborough, North Carolina. Scott has degrees in horticulture and botany from the University of Florida and a PhD um, from Claremont Graduate University in California. His PhD dissertation was on a monograph of the sable palm. Uh, he has worked as a palm biologist at the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Florida, and also is curator of the Florida International University, Vertheim University, uh, Vertheim Conservatory. His interests include the diversity and natural history of plants, including palms, bryophytes, and salvias. Scott is the author of about 175 scientific and popular papers. He is the co-author of two books on palms, and he's also the co-editor of the International Palm Society's quarterly publication. A species of palm from New Guinea uh, was named in his honor, named Orania uh, zonii. He has a third book coming out this fall called uh, Gardener's Guide to Botany. And Scott, perhaps we can arrange a, a book signing for you in either October or November, if, if you agree to that. Scott is a member of numerous plant societies and has traveled around the world looking at plants and studying plants. He is also a research collaborator with the Herbarium of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's here today to talk about a natural history of salvias. Please welcome Scott Zona. All right, well, thank you, Bobby. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about one of my favorite groups of plants. So I really probably should have called this a partial natural history because this is such a big subject and salvia is such a big genus that um, we have a lot to talk about, but I'm, I'm gonna keep it, keep it uh, narrowed down to just really kind of three topics, well, four topics. Um, the diversity of the genus, I want to give you a feel for that. Uh, pollination, biology, seed dispersal, and then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about human uses of salvias. Um, so let me see if I can get this going. Yeah, so I got into salvia not because I was interested in the plants, but because I wanted hummingbirds in my garden. This is when we lived in Miami, and our hummingbirds were winter residents. Um, in fact, they're coming back now here to North Carolina from spending the winter in Miami. Uh, and, I, and my first salvia was salvia miniata, which was one of the raffle plants, great salvia. Uh, and, and it was only after I grew these for the hummingbirds that I began to appreciate just what an incredible genus of plants this is and how interesting they were. And it began to, you know, I, certain questions started forming in my mind and, and pretty soon I was doing some research projects on them. So let's, uh, get in touch with our inner taxonomist and, and just kind of figure out where salvia fits in the plant kingdom. It's uh, a name coined by Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy back in 1753. And it's uh, the genus name is derived from the Latin salvere to save. And that gives you a hint of, of how important this plant was as a medicinal plant. Salvia is a member of the mint family. So the Lamiaceae or Labiatae, if you prefer. Uh, and it's in its own subtribe, the subtribe Salviini. It's one of three genera in the subtribe, uh, but it is, it is the, the, the biggest genus in the subtribe. The others are just little tiny, couple dozen species among them. Salvia has over a thousand species. It's one of the biggest genera of flowering plants. There's only about 10 or 15 or so genera that approach salvia in that size. It's not the biggest genus of flowering plants, but it's one of the biggest. And then when you add in all the cultivars and the hybrids and the selections that have been made, uh, that just expands the number even more. So it's a big, big, big genus. This is uh, uh, redrawn from a molecular study that was published in 2007. And the good thing is it shows that salvia is a what we call a natural group. So uh, it is a single lineage from all the other mint family members. The, the subtribe salviini is a natural group. It's, a, it's, it's the ancestor. The ancestor and all of its descendants make up the subtribe salviani. The problem is that salvia is not a natural group. You can see it comes out in four places on this, this family tree. Uh, so 
what to do about that. Botanists don't like having uh, a, a genera that has four different origins. We want to have a, a natural group. So there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, one possibility would be to recognize each one of these as a distinct genus. That would that would make them all genera with natural the natural genera. Uh, the type genus or the type species rather Salvia officinalis is up here in this blue triangle. That's the the culinary sage that that we use in the kitchen. Uh, that one, if we if we change genera the genus names, Salvia would stay here, and all these other three groups would have to get new names, and. This, this group here, this is the tropical American group, over this 580 species just in this one group here. And so that means changing 580 names. And contrary to what you might think about taxonomists, we don't really like changing names on things. We only do it when we absolutely have to. So the other option then to make salvia a natural group is to call everything salvia. So call this entire group salvia. And that means these little genera here, Perovskia, Rosemarinus, Rosemarinus uh, Miriandra, Dorostachys, Zumeria, those little genera then get sunk into salvia. And that's good because that means changing the names of only about 20 or 20 so species. Um, it does, however, mean that, that uh, a couple of genera that we grow in our gardens will change. Uh, these, Genera down here, Zumeria, Dorostachys, Mirianda, these are from Western Asia. They're not in cultivation. Nobody's going to really care if those names change. But these up here, Perovskia and Rosemarinus, those people kind of care about those. Uh, so there's, there was some pushback about changing the name. So Salvia or uh, Rosemarinus officinalis, the common rosemary, culinary rosemary. This is now Salvia rosemarinus. So it's a pretty easy name change to remember. Uh, and of course, you can still call it rosemary. Perovskia is now Salvia. So Perovskia atriplicifolia is now Salvia yangii. Thank goodness, much easier to say. Uh, believe it or not, there already is a Salvia atriplicifolia, which is why it had to get a new name, Salvia yangii. So Rosemarinus and Borofsky are gone. They're now all salvia. And now we have a natural group that we can call salvia. So going back to that big American group with the 580 species, that's the subgenus Callisphacy. And this was a project that actually I was involved in, uh, came out a couple of years ago, that looks at uh, species distributions and uh, species richness uh, across the Americas. This, this subgenus is found only in the Americas, although it's not the only group of salvias that we have in America. There are other salvia groups that occur here in the Americas, but this group, Salvia callisphacy, is only in the Americas. Uh, and the numbers here, so, oops, let me go back. Um, the numbers here, uh, 19 species native to the United, continental United States, three of which are endemic, so found only in the continental United States. Yeah, and the darker color so green, the, the, the higher those numbers are. So uh, what's immediately obvious is Mexico is, is the big winner here. 295 native species, 243 of which are found only in Mexico, so endemic to Mexico. The other uh, area is the, the Andes are pretty rich in salvias as well, but Mexico seems to be the, the center of diversity for the genus or for the, the subgenus Calisphacy. The other center of diversity for the genus salvia is over in Turkey and, and kind of Western Asia. That's another uh, hot spot for salvias. Okay, so what the, the one of the questions that, that uh, immediately presents itself is why is salvia so diverse? Why did this genus just explode and and create more than uh, a thousand species? This is our our native salvia azuria, which is a member of that American Callisphacy group. And part of the reason we think that this genus is so successful and so diverse lies in the floral morphology and how it relates to pollination. So let me just show you kind of a sample of a salvia. This is salvia palifolia, and uh, it has a, a, a calyx of, of five few sepals, you know, two-lipped calyx. And then it has 
uh, five fused petals that are fused together to make a tubular corolla with two lips. And then you can see two stamens up there and a stigma style. Uh, so what is it about this flower that, that, that gives us a clue to its, uh, the, the, genus, the, uh, the success of the genus? Well, a uh, couple of things, or a few things. Oops, right there. Um, horizontal flower, we know that horizontal flowers are really important in pollinator efficiency. So plants with horizontal flowers have more efficient pollination. It has that tubular two-lipped uh, corolla that uh, means that there's kind of only one way to enter the flower and it has lots of nectar. That means it's going to encourage pollinators to come back. So it encourages pollinator fidelity. Uh, it has two stamens that provide very precise pollen placement. And let me, and the reason it can do that is because of this, the stamen lever mechanism. And let me show you what that's all about. So here's a typical stamen from a typical plant. In this case, a hypericum. Uh, typical stamen there on, in the diagram on the, the left. And if we put names on the parts, you have the filament, which is the little stalk, uh, the two anther sacs that contain the pollen, and then the connective that joins those two anther sacs. This is what you find in basically all other genera of flowering plants, some variation on this theme. In salvia, the stamens look like that, totally crazy. They look nothing like a normal stamen. Uh, if we put names on things, there's the filament in salvia. The filament is a very short little fulcrum. The connective, which in most stamens is just a little bit of tissue that you don't even notice, is in salvia elongated into, into this big arm that is uh, uh, the lever for this mechanism. The uh, anthers are reduced down to one anther sac that has the pollen. The other end of the connective has the other sterile anther sac, which uh, that's this part here, which is called a paddle for obvious reasons. So let me show you how this, this, this crazy stamen lever works. Uh, up at the top there on the upper right is uh, the salvia that I'm gonna use as my example here, salvia pretensis, European species up there. And here's kind of a cutaway diagram of the flower. And you can see uh, it has, uh, has a superior ovary. There are, it's a, um, the ovary is, has four lobes to it, two of which have been cut away for this diagram. Uh, there's also a nectary there that produces nectar that's not really shown here, and a long slender style and the stigmas up here in the upper lip. Here's the filament. The filament is that the little stalk for the stamen. It's that little fulcrum right there. And then there's the paddle and this big long arm that is the, the uh, lever that is connective tissue. And there's the one fertile anther sac up there. So when an animal enters the flower, uh, like this bee is diagrammed entering the flower here uh, to get to the nectar, it has to push that, that paddle out of the way. Well, of course there are two paddles because one's cut away here. So it pushes the paddles out of the way. And as it does so, that anther sac is just levered down and smacks the back of the bee with pollen. Very precise, very accurate, and, and very efficient pollen placement. Uh, and then uh, after a few hours later, or maybe a day later, the style elongates. And as it elongates, it curves down. And now the stigma is right there in the same place that the pollen would be to pick up pollen from subsequent visitors to the flower. Um, the, the, the stamen lever has been removed from the diagram. It's still there, obviously, in the flower. It doesn't go, fall off or anything. It's just been removed from the diagram. Uh, so that's how uh, this stamen lever mechanism works and why uh, pollination in salvia is so efficient. So let's talk, this kind of leads right into what, what are the pollinators then? I, we just showed you a, a bee, uh, but pollinators in salvia are generally bees, especially in, in, in Europe and Asia in the temperate zone, and then hummingbirds, especially in the Americas. There are actually some other nectar feeding birds in Africa that some of the, uh, the sunbirds that pollinate some of the salvias there. But when we talk about bird pollination of salvia, it's mostly 
uh, the American Calisfaci group pollinated by hummingbirds. And we know from the, now from the, the DNA analysis of the genus, that there's been lots of switching back and forth over evolutionary time. So a bee pollinated lineage will give rise to a hummingbird pollinated species and back and forth like that through evolutionary time. So, um, oops, did I, there we go. Um, how does uh, how does this bee pollination work? Well, it, it works so well that California Agriculture put it on the cover of their magazine a few years ago, but they changed the orientation of the picture. This is how it should be um, sideways because there's horizontal flowers. And you can see how good these flowers are at depositing pollen on a bee. I mean, it's it's very obvious what's happening there. And you can also see that the the um, style is elongating here and pretty soon that that stigma will be right down there where it can catch the pollen. I think it already has, you can see a little pollen on there. So what are some of the traits of these bee pollinated flowers? Uh, and after, pollination biologists have been looking at pollination biology for hundreds of years. And, and over time, there are certain traits that they can, uh, that are associated with bee pollinated flowers. One is that you've got a large lower lip that functions like a landing pad. You've got nectar guides on these salvias. So, you know, that work like the runway lights and guide the pollinator into the flower. A balanced, uh, then the nectar chemistry, balanced uh, nectar or glucose dominant nectar. And when I say balanced, balanced between sucrose and glucose in about equal parts or mostly glucose. So th those are the kinds of nectars that, that bees favor. And then the last item there is the PO ratio. That's the pollen ovule ratio. There are four ovules in every salvia flower. And for every ovule, there are, the flower produces about 6,000 grains of pollen. And yes, somebody actually did count that. Um, it wasn't me, thank goodness. Uh, so that, and, and that may sound high, 6,000 to one, but actually that's actually rather low. And the reason it can be low is because pollination, the pollen placement is so efficient. Now, this is what got me into salvias and I could spend all morning looking at pictures of hummingbirds going after salvia. I won't, I, it, it's, it is just wonderful to watch hummingbirds visit the salvia. So, uh, and you can see what it's doing there. It's not putting the pollen on the back of the mirror, it's putting it kind of on the forehead or on the top of the head. You see those stamen leafers doing their thing. So what are the characteristics of bird pollinated salvias? Well, uh, the red or purple color is very common. A long tubular corolla, also very common. Uh, and they don't have a landing pad because of course hummingbirds don't need to land. Uh, and then the nectar chemistry is different. The nectar is rich in sucrose. Remember the bee pollinated ones were, were mostly glucose. And then the pollen ovule ratio is much higher than what we saw in bee pollinated. So 12 to 17,000 grains of pollen to one ovule. So um, that's the birds and the bees. Um, but as you might expect with a genus that's so big and so diverse, that maybe there's more to it than just birds and bees. Uh, and in fact, uh, the more we look into salvia, the more interesting things we're finding out about pollination. And uh, so I have four or three stories to tell you, but I wanna stress that last point, And that is that most species have not been studied. Out of a thousand or so species, I can think of maybe about 25 to 50 that have been studied in the wild so that we actually know what pollinates them for sure because we've seen it happen. Um, most of the species have not been studied. So here's the first one I wanna tell you about. This is Salvia mohavensis. This is one of the American Calisfaci group, but it's in a very particular group, a section called Adobertia, and these are the California sages. And there are about 25 species in Southern California. I think they get over into Arizona, maybe, and certainly down into Mexico. Uh, and they look rather different than, than typical salvias. Uh, the corallas look a little less uh, tulip. They look more kind of more round shape to them. Uh, you can see very uh, extended or uh, exerted anthers. Uh, and this is pollinated by 
the Delhi Sands flower loving fly, which is a long tongue fly in the picture there. Uh, and this fly is the only fly that's on the US endangered species list. Uh, it's found in Delhi Sands, which is a geological formation right around Riverside, California. And if you know Southern California and Riverside, lots of agriculture, lots of suburban sprawl. So there's only about 3% of the habitat left. Um, now, this is not a case of, you know, the fly is the only pollinator of the salvia and the salvia is the only food plant for the fly. It's not quite that one-to-one. -one. There are other insects that visit the salvia and there are other nectar sources for the fly. But I want to stress that it's, it's there's, again, more to the story than just birds and bees when we have a, a, this endangered species feeding on salvia and pollinating it. This is a uh, uh, salvia white house yi, and this is uh, native to southwestern Texas. It's the only salvia that has fragrant flowers. Uh, we know that salvias have lots of fragrant leaves. That's why we use them in cooking and medicinal purposes. But the salvia flowers generally don't have any fragrance at all. In fact, they don't, except for this species. Uh, and it, it's the only one with a nearly salvaform corolla. And, and what that means up there in the upper left is kind of a textbook diagram of a salvaform corolla. You've got a long, narrow tube, and then the, the, the mouth of the flower just kind of flares open very abruptly. And that's what's happening in salvia white house yi. Uh, long, narrow tube, and then this abrupt flaring open of the, of the corolla. Um, and this is a great little plant. Um, it's from, as I said, from Texas. I've actually grown it in the uh, greenhouse in Miami and uh, didn't, it didn't really like Miami's weather, uh, even though it wasn't getting rained on every day, but it still didn't like it. Uh, but I, I would love to see this in the wild. I haven't seen it in the wild yet. Um, and just looking at that, we can see some characteristics that suggest that this maybe is butterfly pollinated, which again, more to it than birds and bees. Uh, what are the characteristics of butterfly pollination that, that suggest themselves here? Well, that long narrow tube in the salvaform corolla, that's typical of butterfly flowers. Uh, it's the fragrance and then the color, this sort of lavendery pinky color is, is very typical of butterfly pollinated plants. And it's right on, if I put the distribution there, right on the spring migration route for monarch butterflies, you know, that monarchs mostly overwinter in, in Michoacan, Mexico. Uh, and then as they migrate north, uh, they pass right through the habitat for salvia white house yi. And it gets better. Um, it, salvia white house yi grows along with glandularia bipinitifida. This is one of the verbenas. Uh, it's actually very common in Texas and Oklahoma and, and that part of the world. Um, and it is known to be a butterfly pollinated plant. It has, has those kind of lavender pinky flowers and it has a salvaform corolla. Uh, and you can find lots of pictures with butterflies sitting on these, uh, these inflorescences. And it looks kind of a lot like salvia whitehousii, or maybe I should say salvia whitehousii, it looks like it. Uh, this may be a case where the small populations of the salvia take advantage of being surrounded by common the, the glandularia because it makes for a larger display and, and insects respond to larger display. The larger the display, the more the insect wants to visit it. So a little salvia growing on its own may not attract very many butterflies, but if it's growing in among things that look a lot like it, it makes for a larger visual, Im visual impact and that attracts more butterflies. This is, um, this is all speculation. I actually had some funding to go study this. And then we had a hurricane in Miami and then we moved to North Carolina and then COVID. So I haven't been out to West Texas yet to do the study. I hope I will someday. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating species and, and we really do need to know what's going on with it in terms of its pollination. This is a salvia that I have studied uh, in the wild. And, and this is salvia arborescens, and it's native to Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the Hispaniola. And I've done a lot of work in the Caribbean over the years. And I think I must have just been 
Um, thinking about going back to the Dominican Republic and I wondered, well, I wonder if any Southeast ones have been mentioned. Well, yes, they do. And I saw this name and this name, Operescence means becoming tree-like. And I thought, wow, a tree like salvia, that's yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. awesome. So, I want to see so, this plant. So, so I, I um, had a, a student from uh, University of South Florida with me, and uh, we hooked up for the botanist in the Jardín Botanico Nacional in Santo Domingo. And he took us right to a population of salvia arborescence. Yeah, it was great. So nice. um, and just like, we weren't there to see flowers. We did find the, the old inflorescences, uh, but that was enough along with the leaves to know that yes, we had the right plant. This was salvia arborescence. And the nice thing is salvias grow very easily from cuttings. So I was able to bring some cuttings back to Miami to grow in the greenhouse there uh, and actually realized that it didn't need to be in a greenhouse. It could grow outside perfectly well, had some growing in our garden in Miami. And it produces these charming little uh, white flowers, uh, kind of a dense little spikes of white flowers. Uh, and it produces over a long time. They don't all bloom at once. The little flowers pop out day, you know, every day. Um, but observing this growing in the garden, which is always the best way to observe things, is to, to be with it day after day after day. Um, I realized that these, that something very strange was going on. These salvia flowers were opening at dusk. And they stay open overnight. And then uh, they'd be open in the morning. But then by, by noon the next day, they were, they were done. Um, so this, this was really surprising because we didn't know of any nocturnal flowering salvias. Uh, so I, I worked with a botanist from, uh, uh, from Europe who's based in, in the Dominican Republic, Martin Reith. Uh, he got to sit out all night and watch the salvia flowers in the Dominican Republic. I spent time in the lab analyzing the nectar and counting the pollens. In the, in the anthers to get the pollen ovule ratio. And we were able to determine that this was in fact a moth pollinated salvia. Moths are the unsung heroes of pollination. Everybody talks about butterflies and bees and, and things like that, but moths do a huge amount of pollinating. Uh, we don't notice them because they tend to be small and nocturnal and dull colored, not very interesting, but they do a huge amount of pollination. In this case, it uh, was not the, 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 uh, the hawk moths that hover, that do, go for this. It's what, what botanists call settling moths, moths that land on the inflorescence and settle, and they pick up pollen on their, the edges of their wings, and that's how they're pollinating these flowers. Um, we actually did have the name of this moth, and I can't remember it, so I, I won't bother to tell you the name, but we, we were able to identify the moths that's uh, the major pollinator. So this was this work was published in 2016, I think. Um, the first nocturnal flowering salvia, the first uh, known moth pollinating salvia. And of course that led to other people looking and thinking, well, maybe there are other salvias that are pollinated by Lepidopterans. And um, uh, Rolando Uria, who is a salvia specialist in Argentina, uh, was doing field work in Peru, in the high elevations in Peru, and photographed this salvia and sent it to me uh, and said this is, he thought this was butterfly pollinated. He apparently observed butterflies visiting the flowers. Um, first of all, that color of that flower is amazing. I want this for my garden. Um, and then with these very long stamens and long styles, uh, it may well be a butterfly pollinated salvia, but we really haven't done in the, the, the proper field work to, to make that determination. So this leads me to the fact that there are so many species that we don't know what pollinates them. Uh, salvia indica from Turkey and, and Western Asia, these flowers are almost orchid-like in their complexity. Uh, look at the, the lower lip is curled up to make this tube. Uh, the, the lateral lobes of the lip are, are, are spiraled into little streamers there. Who knows what pollinates this? It's never been studied in the wild. Nobody knows. It's probably a bee, but I don't know. Um, this flower, this is Salvia juricicii. It's native to Yugoslavia, but this was taken in our garden here in Hillsborough. It, it grows very well for us here. Uh, the cool thing about this salvia is the flowers are upside down. They, they twist when they're in bud and they open and they're upside down. And here I've gone to all this trouble to tell you about the stamen lever mechanism. 
who knows how it works when it's upside down? I don't know. I, I haven't seen any insects visiting the flowers other than ants get in there, but um, maybe we just don't have the right kind of bees here in Hillsborough. I don't know. This one, Salvia nutans from Romania, right there in Europe, it's never been studied. It has flowers that are right side up, but then the whole inflorescence tips over and, and hangs upside down. So again, what's pollinating this? We have no idea. All right, enough pollination. I think it's time to go on to seed dispersal. How am I doing on time? I'm good. Um, this is Salvia lyrata. This is our little native sage. Uh, a lyre leaf sage that's coming into flower right now, at least it is in our garden, uh, pale pinkish bluish flowers. Um, it's not a member of the Callus facey group. It's a member of this other group of salvias that are in Europe. Uh, it has the fruit there. I'm looking, that's a photograph looking down into the calyx and there is the four lobed fruit and those lobes break apart at maturity into what we call four nutlets. Each nutlet has a single seed inside. Now, in both the scientific and popular literature, these are referred to as salvia seeds. Well, they're not quite, they're actually the fruits, the seed is inside the fruit, but if I slip up and call them seeds, you'll forgive me, I hope. Um, the literature on salvia seed dispersal, or fruit dispersal, uh, is pretty thin, basically, People just assume that there is no dispersal going on. There's no, there's no wings. There's no, no fleshy fruit to attract birds. There's nothing going on here. The fruits just break apart and fall out, and that's it. That's as far as dispersal gets. Um, but as with pollination, such a diverse genus, there's probably diversity in seed dispersal as well. So I started looking into that. And, um, and yes, there's lots of interesting things going on. Um, this is Salvia caymanensis. It's a tiny little flowered salvia, blue flowered salvia from the Cayman Islands, endemic to the Cayman Islands. Uh, those, the, the, the marks down there are millimeters. So you can see it's a fairly small uh, flower. And this is the calyx. And what, when I started looking into salvia, I realized a lot of salvia species, uh, when the flower is pollinated, the flower falls off, the fruit mature inside the calyx. The fruit would be, of course, back here inside the calyx. The calyx lips uh, grow together. They, they move together and they kind of seal the, that opening. And then the whole calyx drops off. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, it sizes there at the, at, the, at the stem, drops off. And the key here, is all these hairs. These are glandular hairs and they're full of sticky little uh, chemicals that can stick this calyx onto a passing animal or passing socks as the case may be. Um, this is Salvia madrensis does the same thing. Uh, it doesn't disperse the fruit. It disperses the whole calyx with the fruit inside or the seeds inside. Uh, and lots of salvias do this. Although uh, if you look in the literature, it's really never recorded Do, do the calyx do the calyces drop off or do they retain, are they retained on the plant and then the, the seeds drop out? We don't know, but in this case, uh, this calyx does fall off and those seeds then would kind of spill out over time or, or if the animal uh, that collects them would groom them, pull them off his socks, then yeah, that, that disperses them as well. There's a whole group of salvias from uh, Western Asia, Turkey uh, that, uh, they produce. They they flower once their flowers are wilted and and you know the plant has been, the flower has been pollinated. The the little nutlets begin to grow. The entire calyx starts to grow and enlarge, uh, and then the whole calyx with the nutlets inside breaks off. And you can imagine that this would make a nice little sail for catching the wind and blowing these things around. So this is wind dispersal. We see this over and over again in, in lots of different ways with salvia. This is salvia funeria from the Funeral Mountains in Southern California. Gorgeous little salvia with those indigo blue flowers. And the calyx is covered with long fluffy curly hairs. And it ends, you end up with these little cotton ball things. The calyx is inside of that. 
the seeds, the fruits are, the nutlets are down inside the calyx. The whole thing breaks off and presumably blows away, although it's never really been studied in the field. So this is all presumption on my part, but um, we think that's how it's, it's dispersed. Salvia um, ethiopis does one better. It's a tumbleweed. It produces a rosette of leaves down at the base and the following year sends up a big flower stalk, highly branched flower stalk, the flowers are pollinated, the, the, the seeds are produced, then the whole thing snaps off right there at the base uh, and blows around and is a tumbleweed. This is native to, to Southern Europe and Western Asia. So this is Salvia romeriana. This is uh, from West Texas. Uh, it's a close relative of our little Salvia lyrata that's blooming now, but it has much showier flowers. Well, at least I think they're showier. Um, these bright red flowers, probably hummingbird pollinated, but no one's ever studied it in the field. So we're just making a, a guess here. Um, and uh, it's a it's really charming little plant, very early flowering. It's just the buds are just uh, have a growing in Hillsboro. They're they're uh, just open or just starting to show color now, and they'll be open in probably another week or so. These red flowers then go on to produce these really nice uh, calices, and you can see the black nutlets right inside there. Uh, and then uh, after, after the spring is over, these inflorescences continue to grow, uh, and they produce some sterile nodes here with no flowers. And then they go on to produce flowers, uh, flower buds here, but these flower buds never open. These are called cleistogamous flowers. These, these the flowers never open, but they self-pollinate and make fertile, viable seeds. Uh, Salvia romeria is not the only plant that does that. Uh, in fact, uh, the little violas that are all over our garden at home, the viola sororia, uh, has little violet flowers right now, but continues flowering all through summer. You just don't see the flowers because they never open and they're down under the leaves next to the ground. And they're producing fertile seeds that then go on and invade your flower beds. So um, that's, so cleistogamy is known in other plants as well. This, uh, uh, here it is in salvia. And as I grew this and started to, to study it, I realized um, that the nutlets produced here from the, the showy red flowers were larger and heavier than the nutlets produced here. Both were viable, both produced seedlings and could, I could grow them out, but they were different size and weight. Moreover, these germinate after about two weeks after sowing, these germinate three weeks later, so five weeks after sowing. So there's a physiological difference in the seeds as well as uh, morphological difference. So uh, this was, uh, this is called heterocarpy. The fruits are two different kinds. It's the first time this has been documented in the entire mint family. Uh, it's first time in salvia, first time for all the mints that heterocarpy has been documented. The dispersal of salvia romeriana is also kind of interesting. This is the, my view from my, my experimental setup on top of a ladder. I've got a plant there uh, on a white drop cloth and I'm dropping water to simulate raindrops. This is raindrop dispersed. This is called ombrohydrocori. Uh, and what happens is you've got the, the calyx with the nutlets in there and a raindrop hits the calyx and the weight of it pulls down the calyx. The raindrop is shed and the calyx springs back up. And as it does so, it flings out the nutlets. And I was able to, uh, the, the white drop cloth there is so I could pick out the tiny little black nutlets and uh, up to uh, 109 cent centimeters. So that's over a meter. So that's a little over three feet in, in dispersal distance, which is enough to get the seedlings away from the mother plant so they don't compete with, with mama plant uh, and away from one another. Uh, Ombrohydrochlor ombro uh, ombrohydrochlori occurs in other plants as well. It's not just in Salvia romeriana. Uh, the little, um, 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 oh, I'm blanking on it. Tiarella, Tiarella cordifolia that, that's native in this area. That has ombrohydrochlori as well. Uh, a lot of the scutellarias do, which is of course also a mint. Uh, so ombrohydrochlori is known in lots of other plants, uh, but I 
this is the first time that seeds have been measured or the, the dispersal distance has been measured. So now uh, we're getting to the, the tail end here. Yeah, I'm good. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about human use uh, because that's always interesting because we're always interested in ourselves, aren't we? Uh, salvias have been used by humans since before recorded history, obviously. Uh, they've been used medicinally and as culinary herbs and still are. Uh, they've been used as food plants as narcotic drug plants, salvia divinorum is the only species in the genus that produces uh, hallucinogenic compounds in its leaves. Uh, and they've been used as ceremonial plants. And I have a couple of examples from those various categories to show you. Oh, and of course, ornamental plants. That's maybe its most important use nowadays. So uh, this is salvia officinalis, the culinary sage. Uh, officinalis means of the of the offices, meaning uh, referring to uh, belonging to the healer or belonging to the to the to the uh, herbalist, and uh, this is what it was thought of in in medieval times. And if your Latin is a little rusty, let me translate that. Uh, why should a man die whilst sage grows in his garden? Well, okay, that's maybe overselling it. It's not the key to immortality but it is a medicinal plant, still is used medicinally, especially for respiratory problems. So um, this is a medicinal plant as well as a culinary plant. Uh, however, if you want to grow uh, your, and have sage to use in the kitchen, uh, your best bet is to grow your own because what you buy in the little clamshell packages or the little polyethylene bags at, at the grocery store are not that, they're sold as sage. They're actually Greek sage, uh, salvia fruticosa, uh, which has kind of, oops, I went too fast, juvenile leaves that look very much like salvia officinalis, but as the plant matures, it produces trifoliolate leaves, uh, and that tells you it's not salvia officinalis, it's Greek sage. Uh, Greek sage has a similar but not identical uh, fragrance and, and, and um, chemical profile as does salvia officinalis, but it's not quite the same. It has, of course, also been used for centuries as a medicinal and culinary plant. Here's an example of a food plant. This is Salvia hispanica, seeds in quote, because we know those are actually the little nutlets with seeds inside, a single seed in each nutlet. And uh, there are the flowers, uh, upright spikes. I've grown this in Miami. It's easy to grow. Uh, upright spikes of these nice uh, sky blue flowers, actually an attractive little sage. Uh, the, the seeds have a, a very peculiar property, however. Uh, if you stick them in water, they, after just a, a less than a minute, usually they'll emit a mucilage from this, the, the, the fruit coat there. And if you can see that little kind of halo around each seed there, that's the mucilage. Uh, and you might think that this mucilage has something to do with dispersal, Maybe, you know, to stick it onto the leg of a bird or something and get it to, uh, so the bird carries it away. That's probably not the case at all. It's actually an anti-dispersal mechanism. It's a mechanism to stick the seed to its substrate. Uh, so after the first rain, those seeds uh, uh, release that mucilage. And then as it dries up a little bit, uh, it sticks it like glue right to its substrate to the soil. Or if the substrate happens to be uh, terracotta, they'll continue to germinate and you have chia pets. Uh, and, and you know, as much as I love salvia, I've never had a chia pet. Right? <laughs> um, so that's, that's uh, chia. Uh, chia, a few years ago, the health food industry kind of got a hold of chia and, and started hyping it as, as well, look at these, these headlines, uh, the forgotten food of the ancient Aztecs, the ancient wonder food, uh, nature's superfood, or this is my favorite up here, nature's most powerful whole food. What does that even mean? I mean, <laughs> just don't believe the hype. Uh, Chia seeds are nutritious, they have protein, they have uh, lipids, fats that are good fats, um, but probably the most beneficial part of chia seeds is actually that mucilage, because that mucilage 
is food for the, the good uh, bacteria that grow in your gut and you're feeding your good bacteria and they make you happy and everything is good. Um, so people that are buying chia seed oil there are probably missing out on what is probably the most uh, nutritious or healthful benefit of chia seeds. Okay, now I wanna talk, this is the last uh, salvia I'm gonna talk about. This is salvia dombei from the Andes in, in Peru specifically. Uh, this is a salvia I would love to grow, but it needs cool, frost-free climate to grow in. Uh, so the pictures here, uh, the one on the right is from a friend who uh, was living in San Francisco, growing it there. Uh, on the left is uh, my colleague, John Dransfield in, in, in Wales, who grows in his garden. Both of them had to take it in in the wintertime into a greenhouse, but then they can grow it outdoors in the summertime. And uh, John sends me these pictures on, on WhatsApp and, and just to rub my nose, I think, in the fact that he can grow this plant and I cannot. It would melt in our summers here in, in North Carolina. Um, but you can see it's a gorgeous plant, the largest flowers in the genus, so three and a half inches. So that's, yeah, about, about yay. Yay, yay long. So they are very long flowers, uh, probably hummingbird pollinated. Uh, hasn't been studied though in the wild, but we're just surmising. Um, it has a ceremonial use in Peru. Uh, this is a, a photo from the, the procession of El Señor de los Temblores Cusco, Peru, uh, uh, Christ of the, of the earthquakes. Um, and these, the garlands you see there are made entirely of salvia dumbei flowers. Now, um, as you recall, in, in the Spanish conquest of South America, uh, they imported Catholicism and there were Spanish missionaries there converting the Incas. Uh, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that Catholicism displaced the native religions at the time. It was more of a kind of they amalgamated or they kind of grafted uh, Catholicism onto the Inca religion. And the Inca religion had plenty of blood sacrifice. They, they were familiar with blood sacrifice. So the story of, of the crucifixion probably resonated with them. Um, and I can only imagine, I, you know, we don't have any records of this, but I can imagine uh, the first time that the local Padre said that they were going to have this procession uh, for the cruci of the crucifix there, um, that locals, the local flock might have been all too eager to use real blood uh, to decorate the, the crucifix. Um, and, and, and much to the horror of the local Padre who, who must have suggested that they go out and find some more suitable substitute uh, and they turned to the salvia dombei flower. So this is still in use, still done uh, every year uh, in Peru. So I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So thank you very much for paying attention, and and I can answer questions if you have any. Now is a great time for questions. We don't have anything active in the online chat. Does anyone have a question here in person? Yes. I was wondering about ant pollination. Is that something that works with salvia? A question about ant pollination in salvia. Well, uh, I don't think it would work in salvia. There are plenty of visitors to flowers that are not pollinators. <laughs> In our garden in Hillsboro, the bumblebees go in and they can't get into the flowers, so they bite a hole in the calyx or the corolla and suck out the nectar that way. Oh, they're 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 really too much. Um, and um, ants again, they could go into the flowers, they could steal the nectar, but they wouldn't work that mechanism because they're not big enough. And uh, actually, ants are not common pollinators generally. Uh, part of the problem is that they have secretions on their cuticle that are antibiotic secretions that will kill pollen, most pollen. So they tend not to be pollinators. Are there other Southeast natives other than the Lada? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, uh, Southeast has about, oh gosh, put me on the spot. I think about 10 species of salvia, maybe, or fewer, than, well, fewer, than, maybe seven. Uh, salvia librata, of course, we see all over. Salvia azuria, which is that beautiful blue flowered salvia. Uh, if you go a little farther south, you can pick up salvia coccinia, which is an annual species with bright red flowers, hummingbird pollinated. Um, 
those are the ones that come to mind off the top of my head, but I think there are a few more species that probably just don't know them. Yeah, Tony. It seems interesting taxonomically that in salvias, you've got these four clades that everybody wants to lump into one, and yet on the genus Serum, they're trying to break out the genus Hexastylus for exactly the opposite reason. Yeah. It's interesting. There seems to be no rhyme or reason. It's just somebody's whim. Well, I, I, I have to confess taxonomy is sort of science by consensus um which is you know there's no there's no one absolute proof for one one version over another uh i can't comment on asarum taxonomy i don't really know anything about it uh but uh i i the the reasons and the motivations behind lumping rosemary into salvia and porovskia. Um, I think those are pretty valid and, and I think those are going to stand the test of time. Uh, and that there's certainly a growing consensus that that's the best way to handle those genera. Just, to, just, just because of the sheer number of name changes. Yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah, that might be it. You know, Asarum has way fewer species. So Changing a few names there uh, wouldn't be so onerous, but changing uh, probably up to, up to about 700 names totally would be a pretty massive and disruptive thing to do. Yeah, Chris. We have an online question. I'm surprised no one here is asked for um, or asked. Uh, someone online is looking for sources for some seed for some of the really cool ones that you've commented about today. I, of course, suggested the North American Rock Garden Society seed distribution, so they should become a member of that. I'm assuming they have some stalvias in there. That's a good place to start. Um, let's see. Seed Hunt out of California uh, has a lot of the uh, Western species and some of the, the more dry growing species. Um, it, it's hard to find seeds of a lot of these. Um, uh, I, I probably acquired most of the plants in, in growing in Miami from just mail order nurseries like Tony's and mm -hmm. other places. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of them are just not really in the trade. There's beautiful salvias out there, and they're just not in cultivation. About six so far over here. <laughs> okay, six <laughs> salvia seeds up there. Yes. I'm from Kosovo. Thank you for all you said. It's very accurate. Um, and the question is you mentioned going to the Dominican Republic and you have how do you do that and what's the law about Yeah, well, I was I was doing it with permits and, and with inspections. Miami is a great port of entry for the Caribbean. So the the plant inspectors there know what to do with plants. And, and like I say, I had my permit and my phytosanitary and all that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to encourage people to just go around and <laughs> bring stuff back in their luggage. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, it, it, it does require permits. You're right. They must get caught on their socks. And yeah, well, they, they do sometimes catch on the socks, but no. Chris. We have another online question, Scott, about finding information on the medicinal, uh, medicinal properties um, for some of these and also um, uh, maybe edible ones and where could possibly recipes be located too. Ooh, that's a question I, I really am not prepared for. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know, there's... Lots of online information about salvia divinorum, the, the hallucinogenic sage. Uh, lots of comments. You see people saying, I was at a nursery and they had sage and it had four-sided four stems, so I know it was sage. And, and they were getting all excited that they found salvia divinorum in their local nursery. Uh, no, they didn't, but they, <laughs> they didn't realize there are, you know, 90, 999 other species. Um, so no, I, I really don't know of online sources for or references for the medicinal uses of say of salvias. I'm it's kind of not my field. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. No, no worries. Got another one for you. We'll just make it a, a two part one. Uh, since you're now in Zone Seven, can you recommend any small varieties for this area, and also any good ones for shade? Uh, I let's see, growing uh, lots of the salvia micrantha uh, hybrids. Uh, Tony can probably speak to this more than I can. Lots of those are, are do really well and, and are perfectly hardy in this part of the world. Uh, I mentioned I have Salvia jurisicii growing in the garden. Um, I think what other Salvia romeriana I have coming up. 
Uh, I have a, some that are kind of tender or semi-tender. They, they die down. I just mulch them and then they come back. So they're all coming back. So even things like the Mexican sage salvia, the cantha, it's all coming back. Uh, I, it dies down during the winter and I just mulch it and it seems to be okay. Um, Tony, is there more that you want to add to that list? Uh, the what's the um, the yellow Japanese one? Koyami. That's a that's a good one. That's really super hardy and it's kind of deer food. But uh, if you can keep the deer off it, it's okay. And we'll be selling it at the J.C. Walston plant sale. There you go. Lunch that one of our members donated. Awesome. I think he was dividing Tony's plants. <laughs> yeah, it kind of spreads over an area, but it's easy to control. Yes. There's like one that's kind of a more with a woody type salvia that just kind of looks really big, and then there's another salvia that's kind of like a upright, kind of just a different texture, more wood texture. And what is what is the difference? Um, well, you know, there, there, there's such diversity in growth forms. You can have little annuals, herbaceous annuals, you can have herbaceous perennials. You can have woody plants that are basically shrubs, and you can have even salvia arborescens, which is almost tree-like. Um, so a lot of diversity in growth habit, and and you know I don't know from your description which species you're thinking of. Or you're, Say, for example, hot salvia. Yeah. You know, it's more. It seems like more of a woody type. Yeah, those are kind of sub shrubs. They they are woody, and they have woody branches. Uh, so that's one of the salvia micrantha hybrids. And if you compare that to like Amistad, you know, the, the difference in the texture. Yeah. And, you know, the different types of plants that you have in Amistad, you know, the greener, more upright. Amistad is probably more of a of a herbaceous perennial that would die back during this this the winter and then re-sprout, um, maybe with a little mulch protection. Uh, I, d I haven't grown Amistad, so I don't don't have a lot of experience. Yeah, it's 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 around in the trade. Yeah, yeah. The the little um, salvia micrantha hybrids, all the little those little woody sub shrubs. Uh, you know, they're we they're perennial, but they're not immortal. Um, and so I would recommend taking cuttings. They grow so easily from cuttings, and kind of regenerating them periodically because after a while, at least in my experience, they tend to look a little sad after a couple of years. Got another online one, Scott, uh, someone from the southeastern part of the state, so Wilmington area is looking for some uh, good suitable salvias for their growing area. So maybe something that maybe not quite hardy enough in this area, but possibly over there uh, has already done the red leaf, the uh, salvia lirata and things like black and blue and hot lips. Oh, those are all great some ones. Other, um, other neat ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, um, again, uh, this is Salvia Mexicana Limelight. Uh, Mexicana will die back in the winter, but maybe in a little slightly warmer climate wouldn't, wouldn't be killed. Uh, I have Salvia Mexicana in Hillsboro that's coming back after, after the winter, uh, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, Salvia Guaranitica, it does kind of spread. It has kind of underground tuberous roots that spread but uh, it would it would be die back in the wintertime, but I'm sure it would come right back. Um, oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Salve Lucantha, the, the Mexican sage, that's a good one. Uh, you can get all white varieties, you can get the white and purple varieties, then you can get all purple varieties. So um, there's different cultivars of that one. Great, thank you. Yes. Peruvian zombie eye, how tall is that? Uh, no, it actually can get quite tall. The plant, she's asking about uh, Salvia dombei, that the one with the long flowers. Uh, it's sort of a sprawling, kind of almost a vine. It doesn't, it doesn't twine, it, it can't climb on its own, but it, it kind of climbs through trees and shrubs and it can be, get 30 feet. Yeah, it gets quite tall. Uh, in cultivation, I've never seen more than about 10 feet tall, but uh, but in its in in good in good habitat in Peru, it could easily get thirty feet. Can I ask a question. I failed at transplanting one one time. But is it true you can any transplant tips and or did you say you can do cuttings for most types of salvias? Uh, yeah, most salvias. It's been my experience. Most salvias grow easily from cuttings. 
Uh, I don't have any transplanting tips. I mean, you know, treat it like you would any transplanting any other plant, you know, just give it lots of water until it's established. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. What a way to end the year. That was, I learned so much and I would have loved to have taken your classes. It was just um, really a great experience. And I know that you offer some online courses. I forgot to ask you about that while you were at the microphone. Are there any going on now that people might? Okay, but maybe. Maybe follow you on IG to see when that's happening. So. It's mostly. Oh, mostly on Twitter. Okay. I have to start that now. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was just amazing.